Specifically, Inanna was associated with the planet Venus, as I was saying, and she has her own story about a descent into the underworld. Uh, she goes down into the underworld to meet her sister, Areshkigal, who is the mistress of the dead, uh, her sister, and Inanna has to undergo the death process. She dies, they hang her body up on the wall as an early precursor of the crucifixion image. The first crucified image is actually of a woman. And then she has to be re resurrected and brought back, just as Venus you know, sinks on the western horizon, disappears, and reappears a few weeks later on the eastern horizon as the morning star. That's, that's her cult, and that was the main cult of the city of Uruk. But now Gilgamesh is descended. He comes from the city of Uruk. He was originally a king there about 2600 BC. And he comes from a solar dynasty of rulers. His father was Lugabanda, whose father was Enmerkar, and Enmerkar's father was the sun god. So he comes out of the solar dynasty. The city of Uruk has a solar dynasty. And the city of Ur the city of, was the city of the moon god Nanasin. Nanasin was the moon, and uh, so we have these two cities, one being solar, one being lunar. And it's from the city of Ur that Leonard Woolley uh, unearthed those famous great colorful tombs that we find there. They're from the, uh, the first dynasty of Ur, uh, and they date back to about 2600 BC, which is just about the time that Gilgamesh was, was king in Uruk. And indeed, one of, the Gil one of the early Sumerian Gilgamesh stories has him dying, it's called the death of Gilgamesh, has him dying, and then they have a great funeral, and he's buried in a tomb underneath the Euphrates River, uh, in a tomb that is very elaborate with lots of uh, jewel and bronze uh, swords and weapons and spears, just as the royalty of the city of Ur in these great tombs unearthed in the 1920s by Sir Leonard Woolley had all of this wonderful jewelry and lapis lazuli and turquoise and carnelian and uh, these wonderful necklaces and, and so forth. All this elaborate, uh, clearly Ur was a thriving city. It had become thriving from its trade. It, it was at the head uh, of the, the trade system of the Persian Gulf that went down to Magan, and, which was Oman, and um, uh, Bahrain. So um, one of the main things about the, the afterlife, though, for the Mesopotamians is that it was, um, it was a very dark and gloomy place, unlike for the Egyptians, where it was a bright, fantastic, sunny place. Uh, for the Mesopotamians, it was a bright, gloomy place, a dark, gloomy place in which uh, the dead sat around eating clay uh, with feathers on them, and it looked very much like the afterlife looks the way Homer describes it in the Odyssey, as a realm of twittering shades. And I think that with the, the all this imagery in the first dynasty of Ur with their burial cults, I think they, they were trying to take all this stuff with them so that they could brighten up the afterlife and bring the same kind of opulence that the city of Ur had in 2600 BC down into the underworld with them in Ereshkigal's kingdom, what's called Aralu or Ir Irkala um, or Kur, various names for the underworld, and brighten it up. They were trying to change it. To, to, so they spent a lot of money and extravagance on these tombs and cults as an attempt to, um, to lighten up uh, the realm of the afterlife. So uh, the point that I'm making is that in, indeed Borkenau is right. There was a lot of energy put into the afterlife in both these societies, in Egypt and Mesopotamia. And I need hardly point out uh, what went on in Egypt in terms of, of the afterlife and the, the, the amount of lavishness that was uh, spent on it. But now what Borkenau says is that as this first generation of civilization uh, begins to wind down, it shifts to an opposite attitude from the death transcending attitude with the cult of Ignaten, who comes in around 1300 BC, 1350 BC, uh, with a completely different attitude, the, atti the opposite attitude that moves from one pole to another, and the opposite attitude uh, that Ignaten exhibits is uh, called by Borkenau uh, death accepting. The afterlife is denied. Um, Ignaten comes on stage and he's a nihilist. He gets rid of all the cults of the dead, gets rid of the Osiris cults, sends armies of soldiers out across the land, uh, to put all the other cults out of business, especially any cult associated with the god Amun uh, that he absolutely hated. And he left Thebes. Um, this is a classic example of Toynbee's uh, secession uh, of the proletariat, although in this case it's the secession of the rulership. It secedes, goes upriver, and he builds the first utopian city, Akadatun, which is the world's first utopian city. Uh, it's a city uh, that's dedicated to the sun. His god was the sun, not the actual physical sun, but a phantasmic sun that burns away all the deities of the underworld, chases them all away. Uh, there, are, there are still burials going on, but with very little of the imagery that was previously associated with all of this. And uh, Ignatin puts all the emphasis on this world, 
His temples don't have roofs uh, so that the sun can be worshipped directly as soon as you go in them. And a lot of envoys from other cultures from the Middle East would complain that he would keep them out there waiting uh, in the desert sun. You know, it was a climate somewhat like, like uh, Phoenix, where it's just scorching hot in the summertime. And he would keep them out there waiting in the sun, and they would complain about this. Um, but the, this death-accepting attitude, which is nihilistic, and um, Borkenau basically identifies Ignaton here as uh, the first Socratic man. What we were talking about before in the lecture on Nietzsche and the birth of tragedy, where Nietzsche talks about the coming on stage of the Socratic man as the avatar of reason, represents the beginning of the dissolution of the culture forms, their destabilization by reason applied to them, which sterilizes them and dissolves the culture. Borkenau knew this. After having read Spangler, he, he had a very clear idea of the morphology of civilization that it unfolds with this early mythopoeic period that then gives way to philosophical uh, uh, metaphysics, and then that gives way to rationalism, an age of enlightenment where there's some kind of enlightenment movement and individuals uh, bring in cults of ethics and pragmatism and rationality that then bring into question the original bundle of axioms that made the civilization possible in the first place, and it destabilizes the culture, causes the earliest beginnings of its, of its eventual dissolution, and from there on, uh, it ossifies and petrifies. And he says that basically Akhenaten uh, represents the, the, he doesn't say that he's the Socratic man, but he does say that he, he represents the beginning of this enlightenment process that destabilized Egypt and uh, sent it downhill into a state of petrifaction ever since. So cultures end with this phase of rationalism and criticism. And then what happens is uh, a barbarian age comes in, uh, this is the barbarian age of 1200 BC in the Mediterranean. A whole bunch of civilizations collapsed. Egypt was one of the very, very few to survive, uh, and it, but it did so with difficulty. Um, there were all these invasions of barbarians called the Sea Peoples. They went all over the Mediterranean, plundering and pillaging. A lot of them just brought families with them. A lot of them were just immigrants looking for new places to live. We don't know the cause of what, what caused this, what destabilized it. There have been various theories. Uh, that there may have been some kind of cosmic catastrophe or something. We don't know what happened. There was a massive population displacement, and the Sea Peoples went, uh, one group uh, known as the Peleset became the Philistines in Palestine, which is named after them, and then another group called the Ahuia became the Achaeans. They went in the other direction and settled Greece. They invaded the Mycenaean culture there, caused it to collapse. The Dorians came in, they brought ironworking with them, and they brought the cult of burning the dead with them. Um, so what happens in a barbarian age, Borkenau says, is that there is a regression to the original death paranoia of the primitive societies. Now this death paranoia manifests itself in this fact that there's a suspicion that everyone is the cause, uh, metaphysically somehow, of everyone else's death. So we get all these myths and these epics that come out of barbarian ages in which uh, you get all the sibling murder, like in the, in the Eddas with the Siegfried saga, uh, there's all this family strife and rivalry, and then uh, in the myths in uh, the Homeric world, you can still see echoes of them in the Agamemnon story where he goes home and he's murdered by his wife, and Oedipus in the family drama there. These are echoes from this period. And so all this uh, murder goes on because of this increasing paranoia, and that's the first part of the barbarian age. The second part of it, though, its function is to activate the collective unconscious again. The myth-forming processes of the collective unconscious are reactivated by the barbarian hordes, and they produce the basis of the, the, the new archetypes come up, and they lay the groundwork for uh, the new civilization that's going to come into being. So we get a new social hierarchy, we get new religious laws and rules that bring this death paranoia under control and harness it, it comes under control, and uh, the new civilization comes out of this. And he says that what happens with the new, the second generation of civilization that comes in with the Hellenic and Hebraic societies is that um, it's almost as though um, what they do, they start out, uh, um, they're a, it's a death-accepting society, exactly like Akhenaten was. And the entire second generation of culture is a death-accepting, not a death-transcending one, in which in the Hellenic and Hebraic world, the afterlife, there's no interest in the afterlife, and the interest is in this world, an achievement in this world. And so they basically continue Ignaton's war against the cults of the dead, Moses and Homer, uh, Borkenau says. They, he, they continue the war against the cult of the dead. 
and um, in the uh, in the second generation. So we get this idea uh, in the Hellenic uh, society. You get mummification in Egypt now gives way to the burning of the dead, which is tantamount to a lack of interest in, in the cult of the dead. The dead is burned. You get this dark, gloomy picture of the underworld as as we get a glimpse of it in Homer in the Odyssey when uh, Odysseus goes down into the underworld and he sees Achilles there as this shade uh, who complains about how awful it is down there. Um, it, it's not a fulfilling place. It's not a place that you want to go to. And the emphasis is on uh, the attainment of immortality through the achievement of great deeds in this world, the heroic, uh, Homeric deed, the short life full of deeds that Achilles exemplifies. That becomes the ideal. In the Hebraic world, in the world of the Old Testament, it's the entire community itself that is immortalized. The, the, the Jewish community as a whole becomes immortalized. And the idea there of the afterlife is Sheol, and it's too, like Hades, it's a dark, gloomy place that nobody was interested in. And there's very little talk about the afterlife in the Old Testament. If you read through the Old Testament, it's, it's almost non-existent. So there just isn't in, any interest in the afterlife in this second generation of culture, which is not death transcending, but death accepting, as Borkenau puts it. And then he says that then this eventually gradually gives way back to the other pole, the death transcending pole with the coming on stage of Christianity, which is indeed otherworldly, once again, just as Egypt and Mesopotamia were. So as it comes to the end of its cycle, Christianity comes in as, as the third generation, and it occurs without a dark age. In this case, Christianity comes into being from out of the, uh, the carapace of the dying Hellenic civilization without, without a dark age interval. And it comes into being, and it has a new kind of otherworldliness. It, once again now, is death transcending. So we've gone back to the death transcending of uh, Egypt and Mesopotamia. But uh, we haven't just, with Christianity, it's not just a regression to those cultures. Uh, it's a turn on the spiral, and it brings, uh, it retrieves this emphasis on this otherworldliness, but it brings along with it the uh, pragmatism and, and the cult of ethics that the Hellenic society had worked out, the personal responsibility that salvation is, you know, it's, it's, it's up to you, and your behavior determines where you're going to go in the afterlife. This new ethical slant that was missing in the Egyptian world. In the Egyptian world, the afterlife was not based on ethics. It was based on the idea of magic. Your ability to master magic and pronounce the right spell would unlock all the doors in the underworld. This is why uh, a ritual known as the opening of the mouth was so important. After the mummy was laid out, it was then stood upright, and they put a little object to it that was in the shape of the little dipper, actually, or some minor. They touched it to the mouth of the mummy, and it's called the ritual of the opening of the mouth, and it would confer on the mummy a mouth, which is necessary in the afterlife for pronouncing the spells, because you have to know what the magic of the spells are, and if you can pronounce them in the afterlife, you can make anything in that world happen you want, simply by pronouncing the right spell, the doors will open, bridges will appear, and, and you can get through it. So the, the necessity of the mouth was, was absolutely essential for uh, in the Egyptian afterlife, so it's not based on ethics. Uh, it was, however, with Christianity based on ethics, and so it's a, return, a turn on the spiral with a new sort of synthesis of the Hellenic emphasis on ethics with the otherworldliness of the Egyptian world. And uh, indeed, a lot, you know, Christianity did absorb a lot of the Egyptian myths and rites. The idea of the judgment of the soul, for example, with, with the heart weighed on the scales against the feather of Mot, the goddess of truth, that did return uh, in the imagery of Christianity with Michael, the archangel who holds, who holds the scales uh, that weigh the, 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 the damned against devils. And um, so a lot of that energy, imagery returned um, in Christianity. So uh, we get in the second gen generation, the second generation is uh, death accepting. And then as we move into the, um, the third generation, this is actually the third generation, Christianity, sorry, the third generation, we move back into, uh, from the death transcending to with the Renaissance now in the West, a beginnings of a movement back to the Hellenic world of death accepting. So starting with the Renaissance in the West and the retrieval of the Hellenic world, which was death accepting, we get uh, ever since then, we have arrived to where we're at today with a death-accepting culture where we've denied the afterlife once again. We're not interested in it anymore. And so our modern culture is a death-accepting culture, and it's a, cult it's a culture in which, uh, for the first time in history, though, Borkenau says, the immortality of the soul, its existence is completely denied, along with the existence of an afterlife. Uh, and so he says this is 